Yes, there is actually an organization called Future of Abortion Council. Well, the California Future of Abortion Council just released a new report with their recommendations to protect and expand abortion access in California. California abortion centers and their allies in the state legislature just revealed their plan to make California a sanctuary state for killing babies, with a total of 45 recommendations on how California can prepare to protect their high sacrament in the case that Roe v. Wade is overturned. To help unpack the lies and agenda of the abortion industry, Dr. Mark Newman joins the show today. Dr. Newman is the former director of speech and debate at University of California, Irvine, and one of the most seasoned pro-life speakers in the country, a mentor to myself and many others. Buckle up. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Dr. Mark, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, it's good to be with you, Seth. Yeah, long time coming. Um, For those of you who have not met Dr. Newman before, I took one of his speech courses back in early 2016 at Oklahoma Wesleyan University, a wonderful university formerly under the leadership of Dr. Everett Piper, who we'll have on the show eventually sometime as well. Um, a man with the, the, a spine that is entirely dis- disintegrating in Christian higher academia. Um, but uh, you come from academia as well. That's your background, Dr. Mark. It's yeah, true. God got a hold of your heart uh, some time ago, and you've been faithfully contending in the public square, um, debating and speaking on this issue. And you've gotten a lot of people in the game as well. And so um, for the listeners of this show, if you guys haven't met Dr. Newman, Dr. Mark Newman before, Um, He is with Speaker for Life. Um, We'll talk more about that. But before we jump into this horrific report on how the abortion behemoth is uniting across organizations to protect their highest sacrament, um, tell us a little bit about yourself since it's the first time for you on Unaborted with me. We should have done it a long time ago. But a little bit of your background and and how God got a hold of your heart for life. I want my listeners to just kind of hear your heart. I've been in the pro-life battle now for a little over 30 years. I started when I was the director of speech and debate at the University of California at Irvine. I got a call from a uh, associate pastor of a church that I'd been going to, and he asked me to come down and train some of his people. And I said, well, sure, I'll come down and train you. You know, what are you doing now? And he says, well, I'm, I'm directing this thing called a, a crisis pregnancy center, something which will come up again later as we discuss this council report. Uh, he said, would you? Come down, I teach my people how to communicate in public. I said, sure, what what do you do? And he told me, I was flabbergasted. I didn't know anything about abortion. I'd been in the the church for a very long time and I'd never heard a sermon on abortion. And so I said, well, I I don't know anything about your field, but if you'll send me some material, you know, put something together. So uh, I had all the material I'd used to train corporate executives, but I thought, well, we'll retrofit it for this uh, Christian nonprofit group. So he sent me, uh, Curtis Young's the least of these, uh, one of Bernard Nathanson's books and a host of articles. I began reading through them, and I was flabbergasted at what I saw. It was horrifying to me, and I determined, you know, we are going to, you know, make a difference. And so we started off doing small things. You know, I was just doing uh, pro-life speaker seminars locally in Southern California, uh, and then before too long, it, it grew into a regional thing. And then I got an invite from David Ball to speak at the National Right to Life. The doors kind of blew off, and I started training pro-lifers all over the country. Began keynoting banquets began doing training at CareNet, Heartbeat, and, uh, and other national organizations. And so, yeah, I've been at this, uh, been at it for quite a while. I uh, hosted a lot of debates, per- participated in a few. It's sometimes difficult to get people to come and debate me once they have uh, looked at my debate coaching background as yeah. a tendency to make people shy away a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful, Mark. And you were in Southern California, um, for a long time until just recently. In fact, for a while, you and I were only about 30 minutes apart between San Clemente and, and Vista. Now we're up in Ventura County. Um, but you've been behind enemy lines like me for a long time. Um, and, uh, and you recently wrote a new book, which I want you to share about um, at the end of the show as well, because I haven't got around to reading it yet, but I've read segments. I know, I know. I've read segments, and, and of course, everyone is raving about it. So we're really excited about that because we're at a turning point. We're living in a Kairos moment right now. Um, it's time to I, put I, people. That's right, yeah. So and let's talk about this piece. So this just dropped, the Future of Abortion Council, the California chapter, uh, with 40 or more organizations all teaming up together 
um, which, you know, I, I'm sure you've thought this before too, Dr. Mark, man, why can't the right, the conservative movement and the pro-life movement unite um, across organizations quite as well as the left does? Um, we, we love our, our um, organizations, our branding, our lane, and yet the left doesn't care about their lanes. They, they create one fat highway uh, anytime they need to, to protect abortion. And that's certainly what this piece shows here. Um, let me just read this and then, and then we'll jump to here. So uh, here we have a picture of just the, the front of this report for the listeners, but it says this year, the US Supreme Court is reviewing a direct challenge. Yeah, to Roe versus Wade, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, uh, to, to, to over 36 million women, and other people who may become pregnant will lose access to abortion care. It is already happening. People in Texas have lost, lost the protections under Roe and SB8. The uh, heartbeat bill with the private enforcement mechanism went into effect on September 1st. Um, if Roe v. Wade is overturned or gutted, as most legal observers anticipate, 26 states are certain or likely to ban abortion, increasing the number of out-of-state patients who find their nearest clinic in California from 46,000 to 1.4 million, a nearly 3,000 percent increase. In September 2021, more than 40 organizations joined together to form the California Future of Abortion Council, sexual and reproductive health care providers, reproductive rights and reproductive justice advocacy organizations, legal and policy experts, researchers, advocates, with the support of Newsom and legislative leadership convened to identify barriers to abortion services and recommend policy proposals supporting equitable and affordable access to abortion care for Californians and all who seek care here. Well, what a, uh, what a lexicon of the left those two paragraphs were. Um, I don't even know what any of those terms mean. But tell us about um, this report, um, why it's significant now, um, and what are your high-level thoughts on it before we jump into the lies that have, are weaved through this report. The first thing you have to understand is this entire uh, report has been completely manufactured by the abortion industry and their allies. This is not a governmental report. This is not a report that's been put together by academics uh, or by, by people in the medical profession, although the California Medical Association is listed as one of the, the signatories on this. It's also important to know, in terms of public policy, that Gavin Newsom apparently was heavily involved in the, in the creation of this organization. And this is flabbergasting to me. I've said for years that the Democratic Party is enthralled to Planned Parenthood. It's not true. They are their direct and total allies. They aren't enthralled to them. They are their compatriots. They're working with them in order to accomplish these policy goals. And by the way, these are nothing new. You go all the way back um, to uh, the Becerra case right before the Supreme Court, when Nifla versus Becerra. Javier Becerra, who, by the way, is now the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the U.S. government, used to be, right, the attorney general there in California, and yep. he tried to make pregnancy resource centers, pregnancy health uh, centers and clinics shill for Planned Parenthood by putting their contact information right there in their centers. In other words, these yep. guys are not about free speech. They're not about, uh, they view the pregnancy help organizations of America as enemies. But what they really are, and what we all need to recognize is what, what pregnancy centers really represent to these folks is competition. They don't want there to be an alternative narrative. They don't want there to be any competition when we deal with the abortion issue. They want to be the only voice in the arena, which is why they so they, they shy away from debating and they want to force their opponents to do their dirty work for them, right? This is what these folks are all about. You go on, on a uh, shut your abortion pages and they'll say, you know, this is not a debate. I beg to differ. It is a debate, and it is about to, God willing, if Dobbs is upheld by the Supreme Court, this is about to become the biggest debate in our lifetimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I've, I've long said, uh, Dr. Mark, even before BLM and Antifa burned the country down in mostly peaceful but slightly fiery protests, that if Roe v. Wade was ever overturned, uh, you would have full-on riots in the street. And, and I was saying that way before the, you know, the summer of love of 2020. Um, and this is because it's, this is their high sacrament. And, and they are losing their ever-loving minds over the fact that they're predicting, actually, more than most conservatives, huh, Mark? They're predicting more than most conservatives that Roe v. Wade will be overturned because we've been burned by Republican-appointed majority Supreme Courts um, before. Um, but this, this is wild stuff. And, and California Democrats are essentially just political prostitutes to the abortion industry. Um, and and they, they, they will be bought for the smallest amount, and they will get in bed for decades with the abortion I industry. I don't think they have to be bought at any amount. 
I, I think that they aren't. They don't need to be bought. When, when an organization is actually representing your honest views, you are just uh, allies. And this is the thing that I think is so hard for pro-lifers to understand. There are a lot of people in California. This report represents what they really want to see happen in that state. Right. It, we all have this idea, oh, gosh, if we could just show people that, they, that human life begins at conception, if we could just open up our embryology textbooks like the More Persona and Torture book, uh, clinic, uh, The Developing Human Clinically Oriented Embryology, and show people, even embryologists, they all agree that human life begins at conception. That would change everything. The fact of the matter is it's hard for people to understand. There are people who out there who want to have the right to put other human beings to death. It's hard to get our brain wrapped around that because we, we love life and we want to support uh, women and help uh, couples make life-affirming decisions. But that view is not shared amongst the people, uh, amongst the majority of the people apparently in California who keep sending these legislators and this administration back to Sacramento. Well, um, I so appreciate the fact that you said that, Mark. I don't think I could have put that better because there is an educational gap in, in segments of the culture, um, but that educational gap is not uh, an issue in the secular progressive movement or the Democrat Party today. They, like Nazis and racists before them, know that their victim class is fully human. They don't care. And so they label them non-persons and kill them anyways because it's their high sacrament. And abortion is really the ultimate fulfillment of that first, pro of that first lie in Genesis 3, that ye shall be as gods. Um, you know, that's what Christopher Kayser said, right? Christopher Kayser says every single time in human history that we made a dividing line between human beings and human non-persons, history has demonstrated that we have created a moral catastrophe. And that is what we've been doing here in the United States since actually before 1973. Roe versus Wade just legalized nationwide what was happening in many states already. But at least for, for all of that time, we've been engaging in that moral catastrophe and it's coming due. And I honestly believe that when Roe versus Wade is overturned, you are going to see a very clear uh, division between life-affirming states and death-dealing states. And yeah. the outcomes in those states, I think, will become monumentally apparent. But in the meantime, you have this council working overtime to set the groundwork. They, they see the writing on the wall. It's a bad decision. By the way, even scholars on the left have all agreed Roe versus Wade was a terrible decision, and Casey just doubled down on the terrible decision in Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. And so everybody's been anticipating for a long time that this is going to be overturned, and I think this could finally be it. So California wants to get ahead of the curve on this, and they want to set abortion not only in law, it's already there, but they want to literally build an entire culture of death in California and at the same time marginalize any opposing narrative and that's what you see in this uh, in this report that's right yeah 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 of course because um those who, who can justify the slaughter of innocent human beings um will have no problem resorting to lying or cracking down on their political opponents um, okay, especially yeah. if abortion is a blessing of liberty if abortion is uh, to quote our founders is a blessing of liberty um and you're opposed to abortion then yeah, I guess according to Merrick Garland, we're all just domestic terrorists. So, so um, they, they break this down into seven different categories of recommendations and then the sub points under all of those. I pick some of the more heinous ones, but the first one here, Dr. Mark says, the state must increase investments in abortion funds. And by the way, guys, listening to the show, if you don't know, yes, there are abortion funds. There are groups that literally raise money to pay for people's abortions or reimburse the provider. Direct practical support and infrastructure to support patients seeking abortion care. And then here in this graphic, and we mentioned this in the introduction, I found this incredibly sick. Uh, it says that there will be an increase of women of reproductive age, 15 to 49, who may drive to California for abortion care, increasing the number from 46,000 to 1.4 million, which is a 2,923% increase. When I read that, Mark, I just thought, oh yeah, they're like, they're pumping up. They're getting excited for the, the amount of inflow that will, that will hit California abortion centers. But, but um, in your research, and, and you have an article uh, that just came out that we're going to talk about as well about this, but um, in this first here, category of recommendation here, what were your thoughts on this? 
Well, for starters, to argue that there's going to be 1.4 million abortions in California alone, right after annually, right after Roe versus Wade is overturned, for starters, it's just statistically ludicrous. Um, abortion has been dropping. Uh, in the 1990s, it hit as high as 1.6 million nationwide. But now the latest statistics show it to be a little over 800,000. These guys are talking about abortion because Roe versus Wade gets overturned. Suddenly, what, the number of people seeking abortion is going to double, and all of them are going to come to California. Okay? <laughs> this makes no sense at all. Um, beyond that, you know, I know we keep talking about California's got this, uh, this budget surplus. Okay, it's all smoke and mirrors. You know that there's no budget surplus. They, they always uh, want to ignore all of the, uh, the stuff on their debit sheet that doesn't show up in their normal budget. Uh, for example, all of their, uh, their pension plans uh, that they're obligated to pay out. Folks, these people are saying that California is not only going to pay for abortions desired by Californians, but they are going to pay for any out-of-state person's abortion. Not only will they pay for the procedure, they're going to pay for that person to come to California. They're talking about helping to put them up, maybe to provide them with lodging, give them yeah. gas, transportation. Folks, this is an example. In, in my book, Contenders, I talk about the fact that abortion really is modern-day Molech worship. The kind, this is not just political fervor, folks. This is religious zeal, okay? So they are willing to take the taxpayer dollars of taxpayers throughout California and then use it to pay for abortions for anybody that wants it as they come over uh, the California border. It's, it's mind-blowing to me that this kind of talk doesn't get more, uh, yeah. doesn't get more uh, airplay and on news stations or, or from the pulpits in our churches, for example. I mean, people need to be aware that this, this right. document represents the end game for this organization. That's right. That's right. But don't worry, Dr. Mark. I'm just a pro-life evangelical for Biden. And, you know, I am pro-life. I am, Dr. Mark. I really am. Don't worry. I, and I love what you do, brother. But I just care more about quality of life outside the womb than protection of life in it. And that's why I had to vote to not recall Newsom. I mean, it's just pathetic. And I have friends that I went to Westmont, um, Dr. Mark, who, believe, who say these kind of things. And I'm, I'm like, dude, I mean, of course, I could go down and down the line, but it's like, dude, they're literally paying for out-of-state people for their hotel, gas, and food, and their abortion with your tax dollars, but you're a pro-life evangelical for Newsom? I mean, like, th this should be labeled heresy, in my opinion. At the very least, it's syncretism. You're attaching pagan ideologies to your religion, but you're still masquerading it as Christianity, and Bonhoeffer had some powerful language against people who did that. Um, but exactly, I mean, this is wild stuff. And this comes um, in a line of some truly horrific decisions in California, Mark. Just in the last like eight or nine months, you had the one saying, well, this one went back a little ways, but it's saying, oh yeah, we need to put um, men who say they're women into women's prisons. And then California realized, Mark, oh shoot. Well, actually, um, we know they're not women, so they have penises, so, and they're bad guys saying they're women, so they might rape some of the women so, um, oh, here we, let, let's add to the next bill that if you get pregnant as a woman in a woman's prison in California, we'll pay for your abortion. It's like, but you said that they were women, that they, were, they weren't men. It's, I mean, th this, was, this is nuts. 12-year-olds can now charge abortions to their parents' insurance plan in California without parental consent or knowledge, and the insurance company can't tell the parents. Welcome, welcome to Newsom's California. So in the, in the second one here, they say, the state must ensure cost is not a barrier to care and reimbursement for abortion and abortion-related services is adequate and timely. Um, and they really push SB um, 245 here. They say we need to eliminate cost-sharing for abortion and abortion-related services, regardless of the patient's insurance type. The legislator must pass and Newsom must sign SB 245, the Ab Abortion Accessibility Act. So what does all this mean? What it means is that California wants to pay for everybody's abortion. They don't want there to be any uh, financial barrier toward anybody who wants to have an abortion to be able to get one. Um, I don't know what more to say about it. You know, for years, right, the big deal in the Hyde Amendment was that federal money wasn't going to go to pay for abortion. Then Obamacare came down and kind of blew that out of the water. Yeah, the language was still there, but effectively we were still paying for it. By, you can call it by another name, but the, fact, the facts remain the same. And now what California wants to do is make sure that all of you, every Californian, has a material investment in the killing of unborn children. I mean, if you pay taxes in California, you're going to materially participate. 
because they are going to take that taxpayer money and they are going to fund abortions with it. It is, uh, it's way long since past time for California citizens to stand up and say, no more, we're not going to do this anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll, we'll tell you, it's going to have to start from the pulpits. It's going to have to ring from the pulpits in California because it's not going to start anywhere else. That's right. But that's where it has to start. And pastors are going to have to uh, kind of gird up their loins and get ready to go. And that's one of the things uh, that we're trying to train pastors to do is to be able to speak more effectively uh, while still being you know, winsome and still being compassionate, but speak effectively on uh, the abortion issue so that people understand exactly what abortion is, what's at stake in abortion, and what we have to do in order to create life-affirming cultures. But which, by the way, they're the kind of, of cultures we all say we want to live in. You know, 85 million people watch Hallmark Christmas movies uh, this time of year. 85 million. It's and it's not because they want to, uh, you'll notice that in, in Hallmark Christmas movies, there's not an abortionist down the street, right? <laughs> there's not. Oh, super, yeah, they, super utopian. Matter of fact, there's yeah. always single people who have kids. Yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. looking for a partner so Nuclear that they family. can form a family. Yeah. Marriage, and the 85 yeah. million people watch that. There's a reason for that. It's the world you want. Yeah, exactly. right. This this world that's being spun out by this council, it's not a world anybody wants. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Eternity. And, and frankly, because of the work that the church is willing to do, it's also not, please don't ever believe when people say, well, you know, women needed abortions. Nobody needs an abortion. The best response to a social problem is never kill somebody else. <laughs> Dr. Mark, that's just too simplistic and myopic thinking. You must be a Trump MAGA Republican rube. Um, Actually, but... if you knew more about me, you know that probably does not fit me very well at all. But I will tell you this, that the position is pretty simple, right? It's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong. Nothing in, the, in what I just stated uh, can't be proven through science and consistent moral philosophy. And that's why we're unafraid to talk with people about this issue in the public square, because we know we've got the evidence and the moral philosophy to back up what we have to say. And they have nothing but, but incredible degrees of inconsistency, which I'm hoping we're going to get into as we dig a little deeper into this report. Yeah, how far we've fallen from Alexis de Tocqueville's vision of America in his tour mm -hmm. here. Um, that he found the greatness of America in her pulpits ablaze with righteousness. and. Uh, and yet we can't even get pastors to do a once a year sermon on abortion oftentimes. Um, and when they do- hey, If they don't want to do it, Seth, they can contact me. They can find me out, I'll be happy to do it. I'll preach in any pulpit out there. That's right, praise God. And if they do do it, then we all celebrate them as a super pro-life church because our litmus test is so low for a pro-life church. Rather than being outside of death camps that kill your children and contending politically for righteousness. but. Um, anyways, yeah, that's crazy. So that's SB 245. They talk about standardizing telehealth policies, um, with essentially, you know, telehealth, telemedicine abortions, uh, mail order murder, shipping the abortion pill directly to your mailbox, establishing a By supplemental way, payment. Seth, Go ahead. Congrats to Texas, right? Because Texas went ahead and said, no, we're not going to do that in Texas. So that. what California is doing is it's anticipating laws that may come down and they are trying to um, preempt them. And so, yeah, they are arguing for all these things. And I'm telling you, um, California is going all in. Yep. Yep. Yes. Very sad. Um, and I, I hold nothing against you, brother, for, for going to Tennessee. Um, but if all the good people leave, um, there won't be a remnant to contend for righteousness. And you know a lot about contending. Your book is named Contenders, and we'll get to that later. But there, so their third thing here is the state must invest in a diverse California abortion provider workforce and increase training opportunities for BIPOC, which means uh, uh, biracial uh, indigenous people of color um, and other historically excluded from healthcare professions. This includes improve the education pipeline by creating a California Reproductive Scholarships Corps <laughs> open to those training as physicians, nurse practitioners, certified nurse midwives, physician assistants, and in other healthcare professions with diverse or rural backgrounds dedicated to providing abortion care in underserved Cal areas in California. There's a few more here, but um, some of them were incredibly disturbing, just showing how much they're, they're gearing up to, to uh, expand their abortion workforce. Uh, what did you find was the most uh, disturbing or, or deceitful or problematic in this? There's a number of issues right here. One of them is it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me uh, how rabid 
the abortion lobby is to get Hispanics and African Americans and indigenous people to get involved in the abortion industry when in fact they are the targets of abortion. African Americans are, are incredibly overrepresented in abortion statistics. I said for years that if, if the Ku Klux Klan could have known the, the devastation they could have wrought on the African American populace by trading in a white hood for a white coat, they would have done it years ago, right? It's unbelievable the, the, the devastation that abortion has wrought in the, in the black community across America. And now what are they doing? They're trying to co-opt people of color into killing other people of color. And I mean, if black lives matter at all, folks, they certainly should matter here, certainly should matter in the womb. The reason why the black population has not grown by leaps and bounds in this country is because we have bought into the idea that, uh, that Planned Parenthood's got the right answers, and they don't. They're destroying uh, the African-American family in the United States. And for these people to come out this way, I think is mind-blowing. It also demonstrates an utter a lack of awareness of, Mar of Margaret Sanger's background, right? She was a full-blown eugenicist. She did not like people of color. And to argue, oh, no, so we need to bring more people in to join Margaret Sanger in her eugenicist work is mind-blowing. But they don't talk stop about, there, right? Talk about how this mirrors Sanger's same strategy, Dr. Mark. Oh, well, she wanted more children from the fit and less children from the unfit. And of course, people of color fit into the unfit category. And by the way, you can take a look at her strategies that extended, by the way, into clergy as well. That she really wanted to co-opt clergy into convincing the African-American community to participate, back then not in abortion, because I can show you documents that demonstrate that Planned Parenthood was not in favor of abortion. As a matter of fact, I've got documents that show that Planned Parenthood would teach people that abortion kills the life of a baby after it has begun. And that's from uh, Planned Your Children for Health and Happiness, one of the brochures that they used to peddle. Um, but beyond that, uh, what they wanted to do was increase the level of birth control amongst these communities so that there would just simply be less of them. So it's it's amazing to me uh, how they've done this. And not only that, they're, they're reaching their hand, I don't know if we've gotten there yet, but into the medical schools, and making it at least look on the surface to me like they don't want anybody graduating from a California medical school who's not been trained in aspiration abortion. And what this is going to mean, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you have the desire to become a physician in California, but you happen to hold on to Orthodox Christian beliefs, you're going to have to get your medical degree out of state, and chances are great they won't let you practice in state. This is where we're headed, that the only people allowed to practice medicine will be people who buy into this pro-death narrative that they're peddling. And, and that should scare you to death. I don't want to go and see a physician who is all in league with abortion, which philosophers like Gary M. Atkinson in his essay, The Morality of Abortion, which was published uh, in the International Philosophical Quarterly all the way back in September 1974, he said, look, the rational person will reject abortion in self-defense because all of the arguments for abortion on demand, if they actually justify abortion on demand, are equally valid in justifying involuntary euthanasia. And I'm sorry, I don't know that I want to go to see a physician who has that worldview. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. And unfortunately, um, well, just as a matter of fact, ideas... Um, intrinsically have a certain level of ideological consistency to them. Uh, in other words, meaning when you accept premise A before you know it, you're at premise B, before you know it, you're at premise C, and before you know it, you're at your conclusion. Um, and then you wake up one day and you go, oh, frick, I, I don't like where I ended up. Um, but you absorb the premises of progressivism and look where you ended up. But a lot of Americans aren't aware of these worldview assumptions and ideas, um, and now they're coming down the pike. And this is a great example of that. Here you go, to your point, Dr. Newman. Require primary care and family medicine education programs to provide training in miscarriage management, medication abortion, and aspiration abortion. Primary care graduate medical education programs for physicians, graduate programs including in family medicine for nurse practitioners, certified nurse midwives, physician assistants, and nursing programs should provide training in abortion care, right? That's, uh, that's like uh, when you beat your wife and you call it spousal care. So, um, I mean, this is wild stuff. And I've been saying this for a while that uh, if, if the church doesn't really stand up against this and the, and the culture, those who say they're pro-life, um, you're, you're, going to, you're not going to have a physicians, OBGYNs, and doctors who are pro-life anymore. Um, and we remember the, the, 
the Biden Justice Department, remember two months ago, Dr. Newman, two, two months ago, three months ago, dropped the lawsuit against that Vermont hospital um, that coerced that nurse to participate in an abortion. Didn't force her. No one can force you. She could have left, but she did it. Then she sued. And it was one of the most clear cut cases of conscience violations. The HHS was dealing with it under the Trump administration. The Biden administration comes in and they drop that lawsuit. What are they communicating? You can and should be coerced into performing and assisting with abortions upon threat of career termination. And now you're seeing this here with they don't even want doctors to get licensed and become doctors unless they're pro-abortion. Uh, they talk about grants to implement or reintroduce medication abortion in clinics that aren't doing it. A fund for a grant program for abortion training and for providers. Uh, so just beefing up the abortion industry with people who ideologically conform to their worldview. Oh, and in areas where they are primarily served by a religious hospital, which may, for example, be a Catholic hospital where they will not perform abortions, they talk about beefing up abortion care around there. So they want to bring in more and more. See, remember what I said earlier? It's about competition. And you know, yeah. if pastors want to say, you know, I don't want to deal with abortion because it's too political, why don't we just deal with it on the basis of you shouldn't lie? <laughs> right? These people are lying. And we're going to get to that, too, in a minute, where they talk about how uh, pregnancy centers provide all this misinformation. And my response is, oh, misinformation? Misinformation, like when I go to the Planned Parenthood website and I want to read about aspiration abortions, they never, ever mention what's being aspirated. They literally <laughs> call it pregnancy tissue. Folks, there's no such thing as pregnancy tissue. T pregnancy is not a thing. It is a condition. Right? Conditions don't have tissues. Creatures, <laughs> beings have tissues. So what okay. is the tissue that you have when you are pregnant? Well, if you're a human being, you're pregnant with another human being. So that's human tissue. Right? Okay. Matter of fact, we know so much about this human tissue that after the aspiration abortion, they have to put that child back together on a light board to make sure they got all the pieces out. And that being who just a little while ago was, was referenced, uh, referenced as a blob of tissue suddenly becomes a, a, an incredibly valuable source of income for some, pregnancy, for some uh, abortion clinics. And now they don't have any trouble identifying it as human tissue now, do they? No, because they're going to sell kidneys, eyes, neural tissue, right? They're going to sell that tissue to a, uh, a research facility. Uh, folks, these, the, the lies are are unbelievable. And I don't know why out of the pulpits, we don't just simply stand up and say, you know, we're not going to talk about abortion. We don't have to. We're going to talk about the fact that these folks lie and you shouldn't get health care from liars. That's right. And I'm happy to go toe to toe with anybody who wants to talk about whether or not Planned Parenthood tells women the truth. This whole time they're putting out these reports. Unbelievable. By the way, if you see the report that they, they link to there, just read about I don't know, two or three paragraphs of it and their biases will be immediately clear. You might notice early on in this program, I didn't cite from the National Right to Life. I, I cited from a, a very well-regarded uh, medical embryology textbook. I didn't cite from, um, from Randy Alcorn's you know, book, Pro-Life Answer to Pro-Choice Arguments. I cited from Planned Parenthood's own literature. So I don't mind talking about this issue and revealing what is true and what is a lie. And these people, this whole thing, right, uh, what's it, in, in Elf? Their entire organizations are built up on a throne of lies, right? right, right. And this is uh, it becomes increasingly evident. But I think it's really important to all of you, you people who are listening. We can't just sit around here and ridicule these folks. This is a deadly, serious political battle with real human casualties. And so we have to take it seriously. We have to respond seriously. The response. Response, exactly. Because as long as we merely confess orthodoxy but refuse to exercise orthopraxy, then according to scripture, your faith not might be faith and it might be dead. Um, and, and that was what Bonhoeffer so eloquently uh, directed against German churches. And what he realized in themselves as they were launching the confessing church is that we were, we were confessing the right beliefs, but we weren't resisting the evil that we saw. Um, and unfortunately, the church confesses pro-life beliefs oftentimes, Dr. and Mark, but they don't actually resist what they see. Um, and I think scripture has something to say about like your faith leading somewhere and actually doing something. But I, this is something that struck me um, in Rod Dreher's book, Live Not By Lies. He talks about uh, Czesław Milos, who was, an anti, who was a Polish anti-communist dissident. Um, and he wrote about how people that were ideologically opposed to communism but pretended to be okay with it in order to go along to get along and to stay out of trouble 
um, ultimately ended up atrophying their own moral conscience, right? Because just as physical atrophy um, occurs through not using your muscles, moral atrophy occurs through not using your voice to do what you just said, to call lies lies from the pulpit. So then you end up just letting everything happen because you haven't exercised your moral fiber and strength. And at the end of the day, all of society decays as well because you're not exercising and putting flesh to your beliefs. And as you and I will say it again and again and again, the answer is the church, unfortunately. But the church is atrophying. Um, and um, unless we have revival, we may not stop all of this. Um, so, yeah, yes, they go. Was, they, I, I yes. This, this was in his book, The Screwtape Letters. Um, he has Screwtape mentoring his junior demon, Wormwood, and he says to him, he says, listen, as the humans have said, active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive habits are weakened. The more longer the Christian feels without acting, he says, the less he will be able ever to act, and in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. Uh, Larry Osborne, who was my uh, my pastor down at uh, North Coast Evangelical Free, talked about uh, uh, talked about it as a spiritual dimmer switch. The more obedient you are, the more light you're going to get. The less obedient you are, even what light you have will be taken away and it'll get darker and darker. We have to turn that switch up. We've got to shine brightly. That's right. That's right. As Rod Dreher says in his book, to your point, uh, Mark, he says that having to be on all the time inevitably changes a person. An actor who inhabits his role around the clock eventually becomes the character that he plays. So when you confess but never resist, and that's your state of being, is, is uh, abiding by orthodoxy but refusing to exercise your faith and do something about the evil you see, you will inevitably become the coward that you fear. Um, Can we flip that just a second, Seth? Because I've, I've yeah. said this for ages. If you wear a mask long enough, your face will conform to it. So if you don't feel like running out and doing anything pro-life, but you know that God is calling you to it, you, you see the witness in the scriptures, and you know that you should be helping in this way. You should be working with a pregnancy help organization. You should be out in front of an abortion clinic. You should be sponsoring debates. And you don't feel like it. You know what? Do it anyway. And then do it again tomorrow. And the next day, do it again. And you know what? An amazing thing's going to happen after a very short period of time. You will become what you act the things you act out, that's what you're going to become. That's right. That's right. Mark. Well, go, to go back to C.S. Lewis once again, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, don't, don't wait until you love your neighbor to love your neighbor. Go love your neighbor, and you'll find that you love your neighbor. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, beautifully said, Mark. So let's see. What else are they pushing here? Um, Califor fifth, California must strengthen legal protections for abortion patients, providers, and supporting organizations and individuals. Um, they're just trying to beef up and prepare um, in case there is a decision that impacts them as well. Uh, protect people from prosecutions and criminalization of abortion or pregnancy loss. Uh, California law must be amended to expressly protect people from prosecution for pregnancy loss and repeal laws that invite criminal investigations into suspected self-induced or criminal abortions. And I've heard some of the people on the left, they sometimes talk about this, Mark. They say, if abortion's overturned, every miscarriage is going to be suspect. What are you going to do? You're going to go into people's homes every time they have a miscarriage and they're mourning their baby and say, did you kill your baby through an abortion that you induced? Um, and, and so they're, they're like afraid of things like this happening. Uh, there was a bunch of lies here in the fifth point. What, what was a major takeaway for you here? Well, for starters, if you'll recall, for ages... The key symbol that was used by the abortion choice movement was the, the bloody coat hanger, which I always thought, by the way, was unbelievably insulting to women, uh, arguing that they were just too stupid and would think to do this anyway. Uh, or go, <laughs> go visit some old crone up in an attic somewhere. Yeah. Um, the fact thing. of the matter was that, that kind of thing it rarely, if ever, occurred. Um, but they always argued we have to have legal abortion because – if we don't, there's going to be these back alley abortions where we're going to self, women are going to self-abort. And now here they are in this document saying, hey, you know what? We should help women to self-abort. We don't want to, you know, prosecute anybody for self-aborting. And in books like uh, Martin, uh, like Robin Marty's book, uh, Handbook for a Pro uh, Row, uh, for a, is it a yeah, Pro Row America, a Post Row America? Post -row. Um, yeah, Post Row. She explains how you can manage your own abortions at home. I get thinking, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to do that. Um, the That's schizophrenia right. about this makes my head explode. That's, right. That's a great so, point. That's the bottom line point. is, yes, what they're trying to do is they're trying to preempt. It's really funny. California never ma never minds trying to um, extend their reach outside the borders of their state. But when they anticipate 
that another state might extend their reach into California's state, well, then they're going to tr go uh, overboard trying really hard to make sure all their citizens are protected. So, yeah, the, what this basically is, is it's subsidized, what appears to me to be subsidizing malpractice insurance and, uh, and trying to make certain that we cover everybody's bases so that we can kill children with legal impunity. Wow. It's that simple. I, but I believe this is the wow. same section, right, where they talk about uh, how pregnancy centers, uh, and they, I, they just killed me, crisis pregnancy centers. Nobody calls them prior. This just shows you how behind the curve these people yeah. are. Um, That's right. uh, that they're, they're full of misinformation and lies. And I think we've already demonstrated, no, um, the lies and the misinformation are coming from the other side. I, th I find it fascinating. They say, well, you know, in, uh, in ultrasounds at pregnancy centers, you know, they're not fully diagnostic ultrasounds. Well, no, they're not. They're designed to perform a single function to demonstrate whether you are or are not pregnant. Why? That's because right. if you're not pregnant, you don't need an abortion, right? So they have to get pregnancy verification. As a matter of fact, in many states where abortion is legal, they require pregnancy verification before you can seek an abortion. And so what do they do? Oh my gosh, they actually show them the baby. And the baby is literally moving around. The baby actually has a heartbeat that you can see and hear. And my goodness, when moms see and hear that, they have an incredible capacity for bonding with that <laughs> child. And so what they're really saying in this is, yeah. you know, when our when the people when all of the pregnant women that we think need to have abortions go to this other provider, they talk them out of using our services because they bond with their children. We don't want them to do that. No, if we come, we'll go ahead and give them a, uh, an ultrasound, but we won't let them see the monitor. Wow. And the purpose right. from the ultrasound may be uh, to guide that needle in. That's right. Right. So I'm sorry. I, I, these people have never obviously been inside a pro-life pregnancy center in their lives. They've never met with anybody who runs one. And I would encourage anybody who's listening to this or watching this, go set up an appointment to go meet with your area pregnancy center. You will be amazed at the kind-hearted, loving, sacrificially giving people. By the way, these folks, they run entirely on donations. They don't get federal or state money. So on the one hand, you've got a council trying to protect their bottom line. And on the other side, you have got a long-suffering pro-life movement filled with over 2,500 pregnancy, research, pregnancy uh, centers and clinics all across the United States. And the abortion lobby is scared that they're losing the narrative. And you know what? That's right. They are. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well said, Dr. Mark. And to your point, just so we drive the point home, here's from the report. The state must take meaningful action to combat and mitigate harmful and misleading information perpetuated by crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, see report by California Women's Law Center. Uh, they can delay access to time-sensitive services. Um, and then they say here, uh, that uh, we need to uh, stop unnecessary ultrasounds, specified testing or follow-up visits. Um, yeah, so yeah, you no know seeing the baby. In fact, what my friend um, Betsy Gray, who was the director of Santa Barbara's Pregnancy Resource Center Network Medical for 16 years, took it from an underperforming in the red clinic to one of the biggest operational budgets in the country and just left to launch Pro-Life Bank with my friend Nick Vujicic. Uh, Life Without Limbs, at one time the most sought-after keynote speaker in the world. Um, she once told me a story about how they were getting lots of people coming into Network Medical, Mark, um, and she was, they always asked them how they heard about them. And during this one season or period, they had multiple women say Planned Parenthood, right? And we all know how much Planned Parenthood hates pregnancy centers. And so my friend Betsy's going, huh, what'd you say? What'd you say? Did you repeat that? And they said, yeah, well, I wanted an ultrasound. And Planned Parenthood told me that they couldn't give me an ultrasound unless I had an abortion scheduled already. Um, pretty sick stuff. Um, yeah. So what they, what they want is they don't want you to see the baby and they, they yeah. call it that. It's amazing. And when you read this report, you know, some of these ultrasounds may be dangerous. I'm like, yeah, they could be dangerous. Not like, Oh, I don't know. I'm uh, bringing <laughs> surgical instruments in and taking a baby's body apart piece by piece, right? This is like, there was an incredible report put out by, uh, I've got the, the stats in my book. Um, a report that came out of Belgium where you found out that there are not Belgium, I'm sorry, uh, somewhere over in Europe where they were, uh, they had a lot of a tremendous number of legal um, involuntary abortions. And one of the things that they said was that in, in a substantial number of the cases, well over 50 percent, they didn't discuss the impending euthanasia with the client because discussing it might be too stressful for them. 
So we don't discuss it with them. We just do it to them, right? It's, <laughs> it's mind blowing. So yeah, yeah that they, they don't want you to see is the bottom line. And when you think about the effort that's been made to throw a curtain over the reality of abortion, right? You can go on the Discovery Channel and you can see a colonoscopy, you know, but you can't see one of the most common surgical procedures in America. You will never see an abortion on the Discovery Channel. We try really hard to hide people, hide from people, the truth about abortion and what it does. The fact of the matter is that it, it eviscerates, takes the life of innocent, right. preborn human beings. That's right, because most truths tend to be self-evident, and the humanity of the child is self-evident, so it has to be suppressed. That reminds me of what Joseph Goebbels, by the way, said, Dr. Mark Newman, the Nazi propagandist who famously defined fake news, um, and he talked about the importance of repeating lies over and over again and suppressing the truth. He said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people eventually come to believe it. But the lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield, shield the people from the political economic consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. So anyways, there you go. Uh, with you the don't time have to go to Goebbels for that, Seth. You can go to California Medicine back in 1970, where they put out that right. essay. I'd be happy to send it to anybody. And it's, yeah. it says, everybody that. really knows that human life begins at conception and is continuous, whether intra or extra uterine till, till death. The very considerable semantic gymnastics required to rationalize abortion as anything but the taking of a human life would be ludicrous if they were not often put forth under socially impeccable auspices. It is suggested, the authors say, that this schizophrenic sort of subterfuge is necessary because while an old ethic is uh, while, oh, the, uh, while the new ethic has not yet been accepted, the old ethic has not yet been rejected. What was that old ethic? That old ethic was that you are a human being created in the image of God, and therefore you are of inestimable worth. What's the new ethic that these guys? You read the whole article, and they will tell you. They identify. The Judeo-Christian ethic is one that provides an objective value for human life. And they're saying, we've got to get rid of that. And we have to implement a uh, relative value on human life. And by the way, in case you're wondering who's going to be uh, allowed to be the determinant over who does and doesn't live, well, I'll just let you know they were coughing and pointing at themselves a lot. Right. Doctors, in order to be at the forefront of death selection and death control, they argued back then needed to be at the forefront of birth selection and birth control. Folks, you don't have to go back to Nazi Germany. You just have to go back to the 1970s to see that the, see the plan that was laid out and to recognize that they did it and it worked. They got the government, the educational establishment, the entertainment community, um, the medical establishment, and even a fair number of clergy to complete, uh, completely uh, repeat this lie over and over and over again, and it worked. And this is why we're here where we are today. That's right. Wow. I had forgotten about that California Medical Association uh, quote from the 1970s. I need, to, I need to commit that one to memory. Powerful, powerful. Um, let's finish with this, Dr. Mark, because this one has to deal with kids. And this is what pisses parents off. And I've had, um, uh, I've had uh, my, my good friend, um, the former Planned Parenthood sex educator, Monica Klein, on the show a couple different times. And I've, I've studied um, the roots of the sexual, uh, comprehensive sexuality education movement and its roots with Alfred Kinsey. And, and then the, the sort of uh, organizations that branched off of that, Healthy Advocates for Youth and CKITS, the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States, all of what we call CSE or Comprehensive Sexuality Education today goes back to Alfred Kinsey, a man who, to rely on his research, um, interviewed rapists um, and pedophiles um, and uh, had the, the rape of children timed with a stopwatch uh, over a 24-hour period. And even if the children were convulsing or screaming or crying, he thought that they were enjoying this, and so he argued that children were sexual from birth and had sexual rights to sexual pleasure. And when you talk to people like Monica Klein, who were behind the curtain in sexual education circles in Planned Parenthood, them and others will say that Alfred Kinsey is just this hero uh, at Planned Parenthood. Uh, so they talk about CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, adequately fund implementation and monitoring 
of California's existing Comprehensive Sexual Health Education CSE mandate. Despite requirements to provide medically accurate and inclusive CSE for middle and high school students in public schools, implementation of the California Healthy Youth Act has yet to be realized across the state, leaving students vulnerable oh, to misinformation and programs that do not align with the California Healthy Youth Act requirement. Require school districts to participate in the California Healthy Kids survey and include a module on sexual and reproductive health care as one of the core survey models. This should be developed with stakeholder input on sexual and reproductive health related questions to improve student academic performance and social emotional behavioral and support overall health and wellness for California youth. Blah, 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 blah. You murder the youngest youth in America, preborn children, and sex ed is your sales funnel, abortion is your product, and our daughters are your prospects. Um, but can you talk about comprehensive sexuality education um, and, and the push here always for the kids? Because I, I think that if you could get the kids while they're young, they'll serve you forever. That's kind of what I was getting and taking away from this. But what was your reaction? Did you notice how they phrased this in such a way as to make certain that there wouldn't be any abstinence education in the schools? That's right. right. And they, would, they weren't going to be allowing anybody from an outside group to come in. And by the way, when they use the word stakeholders, they mean them. Right. Not <laughs> anybody else. Only them. And if you want to see where these guys are going, all you have to do is go to look at, uh, at Planned Parenthood's YouTube channel, Amaze and Amaze Jr., and you will see some of the most yeah. horrifying Sick. videos right. these people put together. There is Amaze. one where there's a guy, he's clearly, what, how old are you when you seek your driver's license? 16 years old? And yeah. he's got, a, uh, he's got a, a list of things to do, right? And have sex is one of them, right? It's, it's mind-blowing to me. Uh, and it's got picked, two little kids. One of the little boys, very shy, doesn't want to stand up and you know show his genitals to an adult standing at a lake with him. And uh, and boy, but by the end of it, he's all on board. I mean, folks, this is there's a word for this. It's called grooming. They are grooming your kids. And if you are unfamiliar with the work of Judith Reisman on the use of child sexual magnets, I would highly recommend you get to know her work. Um, and folks, when they tell you they're coming for your kids, I know they, they say, oh, we were kidding. They're not kidding. They're yeah. dead serious because yeah, they know that, that. If they, yeah. yes, this is where we are. And this that is LGBTQ why the battle, Zoom yeah. choir thing they did last year with all the gay men. Yeah. We're coming yeah, for so your kids. Oh, it's kid. a joke, yeah. though. It was just yeah. a joke. Yeah. Oh, it's just but, a joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and see, I talk with parents sometimes who say, well, you know, when it gets really bad, that's when I'm, I, then we'll homeschool our kids. And my response has always been, Folks, when it gets that bad, what makes you think they're going to let you homeschool your kids? It'll be too late, yeah. yeah. They'll both. simply take your children away from you. And I know it's hard to believe that they would do that, but they will take your children away from you and place them with more ideologically aligned individuals. Yeah. Um, yeah. The groundwork for this kind of thing is already being laid. When people start getting rid of terms like mom and dad, and replace it with like what child caregiver number one. Yeah. The whole idea is basically to destroy the family to leave every single individual standing naked before the state, with no recourse, no uh, no compatriots, no allies, just you against the state. And folks, when it when it gets to that point, you are going to lose. If you don't believe me, read 1984. Yeah. Right. It's by the way, just to clarify, it was a piece of fiction. It wasn't intended to be an instruction manual. Right. <laughs> That's right. And yet here is where we're, we're headed. And I know a lot of people, they'll listen to me speak and they'll say, you know, you're being hyperbolic. It's, it's never going to be that way. Folks, I'm, I'm 62 years yeah. old. Yeah. I remember back when Roe versus Wade came out and when people said it was going to start a slippery slope and we we're all called a bunch of worry mongers. Oh, no, there's never going to be third trimester abortions. It's never going to be abortion all the way to the moment of birth. But we all know the fact of the matter is, I mean, I've got an article from the National Abortion Federation where Martin Haskell is talking about another abortionist doing abortions at 32 weeks and beyond. Yeah. So, no, I'm not going to let you sit there and say I'm engaging in some kind of bizarre slippery slope argumentation. I'm telling you, these folks are revealing their end game. And if they would have revealed this end game 20 years ago, you've been horrified. But we've been in the pot so long, yeah. right, that we just failed to see uh, where we're headed. So, yeah, we do yeah. need to stand up. And, yes, Seth, I did. I escaped from California and I moved to Tennessee. Um, but I do come back to California with great regularity. I am still boots on the ground out there. I still train out there and speak out there. And matter of fact, I'll be out there a number of times in this coming year already. I'm already slated to be out there. And uh, and I want to see that battle be won. But I have to let you know, 
there's going to be a battle in all these other states too. If you've read Robin Marty's book, they have a plan. They have a blueprint already for how they're going to take pro-life states and turn them into abortion states and how they are going to set abortion states where they are. And so the, the idea, if you're watching Seth's podcast in a state where you're saying, well, no, and when Dobbs comes down, we're, we have a trigger law, we're going to become a pro-life state. If you think that the abortion lobby is going to leave you alone, you are in la-la land. These people have an ideological agenda and they are coming to your door. And if you aren't ready to meet them with appropriate, if you haven't, um, if you have not inoculated your congregations, your children against children. abortion advocacy, they are going to make it seem very, very appealing. And so we've got to set up those, uh, we've got to set up those arguments in the hearts and minds of our kids now, because okay. those folks, they aren't going to stop. That's it's right. demonic. Yeah, things happen gradually, then suddenly. Um, my pastor, Rob McCoy, beautifully once said that uh, tyranny is achieved by incremental obedience of good people submitting to systematic control. Um, and then you wake up one day, and it's too late. Uh, that's, yeah. the, the, that's the famous Martin Niemöller line, right, Mark? First, they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Then the socialists, I wasn't a socialist. Then the Jews, I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak up for me. John Stuart Mill once said that a man who has nothing for which he is willing to fight, nothing which is more important than his own personal safety, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. The problem is there's not very many better men, Mark. We're in the minority. And unless we can beef up the better men and women who are willing to put aside their temporary comfort, convenience, and funds in order to contend for righteousness in the public square, we won't be able to present the type of threat we need to to actually stop the evil that we see in the agenda that they have in mind. So unfortunately, the left has a far more robust liturgy than the church does. Liturgy means public work. They engage in the public for their work work to furtherance their ideology and religion far more dogmatically and with far more commitment than most Christians will do for theirs. Um, and we're coming to a breaking point now. And that's why I'm so grateful for you and your longtime faithfulness. And you talk about a lot of this in your book. And let's close with this. Your book is called Contenders. Why don't you hold it up for our viewers on YouTube? Um, give us a pitch about it, where they can get it. And then we'll say Merry Christmas and goodbye. Thank you. This is Contenders, a church-wide strategy to unmask abortion, defeat its advocates, empower Christians, and change the world. The fact of the matter is, Seth, what you're saying is true. Well, we don't just need to beef up the ones we have. We need to build more of us. And so uh, for the longest time, right, people have viewed this as uh, something that they're into, right? It's some kind of issue that you're a part of. This needs to be something that we all um, both understand the arguments about because it's going to affect every single one of us in one way or another. And then to be able to uh, to unmask it for people so that they don't recognize Planned Parenthood as a place where women go to get family planning help. Folks, that's not what they're about. Um, if you go to a steakhouse, there's lots of other things going on in the steakhouse. But you know it's a steakhouse because what they primarily serve and what they really charge. No, they're charging you for the fork and the napkin and the spoon. They're charging you for the steak. It's a steakhouse. Family uh, Planned Parenthood is an abortion clinic. That's what they do there. It's what they live for. If they can't do abortions, they close down their facilities, as we found out in Texas. So this book is designed to do a number of things. Number one, to help um, reinsert a spine into the pulpits of America by helping yeah. pastors to overcome the reasons why they don't speak about abortion. I identify eight reasons why most Christian leaders don't speak about abortion. And I have to let you know, if they were good reasons, I could understand it. But we evaluate those reasons. We discover that they are not good reasons. In fact, not only are they not good reasons, they actually uh, end up hurting the very congregants they're trying to help. And then we go through every single argument uh, that you would generally run into on abortion at, uh, on a pedestrian level, and we confront them. We talk about the five key shifts, right? Is it a human being? Yep. Okay, but it's not a person. Oh, well, yeah, it is a person. Okay, well, even if it is a person, the uh, circumstances of my conception outweigh that. Well, no, they don't. Uh, well, wait, but the impact of my pregnancy, well, no. And we evaluate all of those. And then finally, what happens is we unmask the fact that not abortion choice supporters, many of whom are just ignorant, but abortion choice advocates are people who really know what it is they're advocating and want to do it anyway. 
And so we reveal that. And then we, we talk about the messaging strategies that we can employ, both as Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, uh, youth pastors, uh, pastors in the pulpit can employ in order to inoculate our people against abortion choice advocacy, and also how to create a culture of life inside the church by helping people understand the political ramifications of this issue, but also how to interface with the pregnancy care movement through organizations like, for example, Embrace Grace, so that we have um, we have a whole life approach here. Folks, I gotta tell you, I heard this unbelievable story from a pregnancy center director who told me that a past, she approached a pastor, a woman had come to know Jesus, through the ministry of her center. And so she said, hey, we've got this 15 year old girl, would you bring her in and disciple her? And the pastor looked her dead in the eye and said, you know, I don't think that having a pregnant 15 year old girl at our church would be a really good fit. Now, my response to that is you need another job, dude. Okay, Um, this is precisely where that woman needs to be. She's gonna come, she is going to be discipled. She's gonna have that child. Maybe a young man from that church will eventually marry her and they'll form a family and they will grow up together and people will see the love, the forgiveness, the mercy and the provision of God in the life of someone else. Because folks, I'm gonna leave you with this. Can you imagine what it would be like if every sin you ever committed had a corresponding physical manifestation, right? It'd make counseling really easy, right? People walk in, oh, Jim, I see you're still struggling with envy because he's got a green cloud over his head. See, everybody thinks that until you realize it would include you. (laughs) There is nothing sinful about a pregnant teenage girl. That's just biology. How she got pregnant might be sinful. There's nothing sinful about the pregnancy. As a matter of fact, my Bible says that that pregnancy, that that baby is a gift from the Lord and a reward. Oh, how can you say that it's a gift of the Lord and a reward? She's only 15. Can I see the hands of all the omniscient people uh, in the pocket? No? Good. Because we're not. God knows. You may not know. So what I'm going to challenge you to do is learn the truth, speak the truth, advocate for the truth, and then go out and save the lives of your unborn neighbors. You know, it's Christmas time. And everybody likes to talk about Jesus because he's a little baby. By the way, I hate it when people say he was an unplanned pregnancy. No, he was the most planned pregnancy in the history of the universe. He was a baby. Everybody loves babies. The question becomes, had Planned Parenthood seen Mary's condition, what would they, they would have, they would have ridden up alongside her donkey and imagine the kind of arguments that they would have tried to make in her direction. And you know what her response would have been? No, this child is from God. And I got news for you if you're watching this podcast today. Every child is from God. That's right. And so we ought to be about the business of protecting and loving our neighbors. And abortion is not the way to do it. Supporting women to make life-affirming decisions is. That's right. Praise God. Woo! They, uh, they call him the Speaker for Life for a reason, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, speakerforlife.org. His book no, is Contenders. Com. Thank you, thank you. I, I, was, I, was, I, told, I told myself 50-50 chance here. Speakerforlife.com. Uh, he has great commentary on his Facebook on current day events, particularly on abortion. His book is Contenders. Uh, Amazon, Mark? You can get it at Amazon. If you don't like Amazon, Books A Million, or any other uh, bookstore you can find, you can order this book. Good. Hardcover and, and paperback. They Give find it to your pastor your... for Christmas. Where can they find, yes, yes, get the get contenders for your pastor for Christmas. Where can they find your article that just got released responding to this report from Future of Abortion? Uh, townhall.com. Excellent. Mark Newman, townhall.com. Mark Newman, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most sought after keynote speakers for Pregnancy Resource Center banquets in the entire country. Uh, I'm a little puny, uh, no name compared to his influence in the pro-life movement. Um, and I, I hope to um, be as knowledgeable, as winsome, and as good looking um, when I am your age, Mark. Thank you for joining the show today, brother. Thanks we'll for putting definitely... out my age, Seth. Appreciate that. I didn't. I just said <laughs> at, when I'm as old as you. I never said your age. I don't know it, but I would guess 39 you or 40. You are the generation that's going to see an end <laughs> to this conflict, my friend. And so you are the future of this movement. So that's right. God bless well, you for the work t- that you do. I appreciate the chance to be on with you. Overturning row is really just the beginning, so we've got a fight in front of us. So thank you, brother. We'll see you soon. God bless. 
Thank you guys for joining the show today. I've uh, been meaning to have Dr. Mark Newman on for some time. I'm sure that blessed you and fired you up. Uh, we'll put the show notes to his book, his website, as well as his town hall article responding to this ridiculous report from the Future of Abortion Council and all of their recommendations to make California a sanctuary state for genocide for killing preborn children. Share this episode with your apathetic pro-life um, default friends, your pastors, and yes, your pro-choice friends as well, because you know what? Many common uh, run-of-the-mill pro-choicers in America are not aware of the radicalism of the party that they're voting for, the politicians. Share this episode with them and show them <laughs> how committed they are to the lengths they're willing to go to not just kill preborn children through point of birth, but to target those who seek to protect them. Uh, and if you don't exercise your moral fiber soon, uh, you're going to wake up and find that it's not just the preborn that are being targeted. It's not just pro-life OBGYNs that are being targeted. It's you and your children. If you want to connect with me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram. Go to my website, sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to see my speaking schedule, or to book me for an event as 2022 is filling up quickly and we are living in a Kairos turning point for the country. Pray that Dobbs versus Jackson is upheld, that the rest of the Supreme Court justices find the same type of courage and spine that Clarence Thomas has, who's the only one I would put money on overturning Roe. Uh, pray for a providential moment and turning point in America for us to get rid of this great evil. Thank you for tuning in. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted. Hey! Hey!